and we're live. Welcome to the NSCAA Live Chat Future Coaches. Today marks the launch of the new NSCAA 30 Under 30 program, an educational scholarship opportunity for 30 coaches under the age of 30 to attend the convention or summer symposium and an advanced level course at no cost. Visit nscaa.com backslash 30 under 30 for details on how you can apply. Today's panel will discuss insights on how to get into prestigious coaching roles and what they did to get there. Welcome, to, welcome today, Kat Mertz, the head coach at University of Oregon, Dawn Greathouse, assistant coach at Notre Dame, and John Morgan, the head coach at the University of Maryland. Let's start by asking each coach just to give us an overview of their path to the current position. Dawn, let's start with you. Well, I'd say... Um... I was in a different situation when I got my path here because I was still playing. I was out in San Jose playing for the San Jose Cyberies and the WSA, and I was in a different situation because I kind of just slipped into my role because Randy was actually looking for someone just to help him out for a few months to get him through the season so he could find someone more permanent for the position. And he knew me from uh, when he coached down at Baylor. He coached me for a couple years before he came to Notre Dame, and so when he was looking for someone just to kind of fill the role for a little while, he gave me a call and thought it was a great opportunity to jump in a coaching, coaching role for a little while and obviously be able to train at a high level during my off season. And then unfortunately, after a couple of months of being here, that's when the WSA folded. So I, I kind of had to make that decision. Do I try to go play overseas or do I go ahead and stay here and really start that coaching career? And I think it's definitely worked out. I've been here for 10 years now uh, working with Randy Waldrum and uh, the good thing was is he took a chance on someone who hadn't had a coaching background and, um, you know, helped me along the way and helped me throughout my career to gain the knowledge and, and confidence, obviously, that I'd need to be successful at a university in Notre Dame. Fantastic. And we've just been joined by Scott Juniper, who's the head coach at UC Irvine. Scott, uh, why don't you tell us how you got to your current coaching position? Gosh, uh, well, I started out my coaching career back in uh, back in England um, and uh, moved here about 11 years ago. Uh, I got my first first start at UC the men's side um, and uh, really just went in there as a volunteer assistant coach. Uh, that position turned into a, a full-time assistant coach position. Um, and then from there, it was just uh, just one thing after, after another and uh, found myself at UC Irvine about six and a half years ago. Um, I was an assistant coach for a year, and then uh, when the head coach moved on, I was in the right place at the right time, and uh, had done a good enough job I guess, uh, to be uh, the head coach position. Okay. And John Morgan, you also started out as a, as a volunteer coach. Can you tell us how you got to Maryland? Yeah, um, I actually you know, started off coaching club soccer uh, in New Jersey at the PDA, and uh, through that experience, I was able to meet Glenn Crooks at Rutgers University and Glenn offered me the opportunity to come to Rutgers and become their volunteer assistant. And uh, so for three years, I was the volunteer assistant at Rutgers. Um, really, it was a great experience for me. It will get my foot into the door for college ranks. Um, and from Rutgers, I had the opportunity to go to Ohio State University, um, the Ohio State University. And uh, that was a position as a second assistant. I spent two seasons at Ohio State. Um, from there, I moved on to the University of Maryland, uh, became the first assistant from, uh, for five years here at the University of Maryland. 
um, similar as to Scott. Um, the head coach, uh, Brian Penske, had left and moved on to the University of Tennessee, and I was fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time and uh, get my opportunity here as the head coach at the University of Maryland. So it's been a uh, pretty long process for me. I feel like I've uh, followed the, gone up the totem pole, um, but now I'm in a pretty good place here at Maryland. And you've definitely paid your dues. And, and Kat, you had a, a pretty good playing career and got a terrific start when you were with April at UVA as a graduate assistant. Can you tell us how you got to the Ducks? Um, yeah, I mean, the uh, path has taken me from the East Coast as a player. Um, I started out at University of Virginia as April Heinrichs as my mentor. Um, and when she left to take the full national team head coaching position, I went out west and uh, didn't know much about UCLA. I knew I wanted to work for uh, Jillian Ellis and uh, took the job uh, without an interview uh, over the phone and uh, packed out and went out west. Um, had a great time with Jill for about five years and then went on to UNLV and was a head coach at UNLV. Um, had a great experience in Las Vegas and uh, the Mountain West. Um, and then from there, my path took me a little bit uh, to the middle, to Texas, and then also to St. Louis University. And then most recently, I was hired in December here at the University of Oregon. I'm um, really excited to be back in the Pac-12 and coaching here at this fantastic university. Scott, let's start with you. Uh, I know you've published some on the sport, but um, how did you know you wanted to become a coach? Josh, uh, I mean, I, lo I look back now, and I was um, – the first time I really looked at looked at trying to get involved with coaching, uh, coaching the sport was uh, back when I was about eleven or twelve years old, and I, uh, I actually knocked on my uh, at the elementary school principal's uh, office door and asked if I could uh, help out with the team. You know, I just left the school and uh, something I was, uh, I just had an impulse to, to coach, I think, and certainly that uh, that's really teaching. You know, I think I got an impulse to teach. I got a, I got a, uh, a real uh, passion for the sport. And I think when you, you, when you kind of connect those two paths, the, um, you know, uh, an impulse to teach and a passion for the sport of soccer, you know, coaching really just uh, is, is what evolves out of those two things. And Kat, you've talked about your opportunity with April and her transition to the national team. Um, you've really had some incredible opportunities early on in your career. What were some of the things that you were doing early on in your career that were able to put you ahead of the curve and maybe ahead of some of the kids that also graduated um, the same time you did? Uh, well, I mean, right off the bat, uh, unlike Don, uh, Don was playing in the WSA. Um, I decided to go into coaching. Um, I had an opportunity to try out with some of the pro teams when I was at UCLA, and I sat down with Jill. Um, and she's an excellent mentor, and, and she kind of uh, we, we sat down and figured out my future, and I knew I wanted to go into coaching. And so when I was out in uh, L.A., um, I worked with the ODP regional and uh, teams, and I got very lucky to be involved with some of the youth national teams when I was out in L.A. And um, so for me, it was really just to try to do as much as possible. I wanted to, you know, do my career in coaching, so I wanted to get out in any field possible and learn from the best and try to figure out how I can take that back to my own team. So I constantly put myself in a lot of different environments, um, but I would probably say that the one thing that separated me a little bit from the beginning was I decided right off the bat I wanted to go into coaching and, and not play anymore. Okay. And John, you've talked about Coach Crooks as a mentor and sort of the opportunity while you were a club coach working at Rutgers University. Um, what are some suggestions you might have for a young coach going out and, and trying to find a mentor and, and choosing the right mentor possibly? Yeah, you know, a mentor, is, it's interesting because usually it's someone that you just uh, stumble upon somewhere in your, your path and that person uh, reaches out and guides you. Um, I think as a young coach, you know, you really have to figure out what level you want, you know, and then appreciate uh, and respect those um, that have come before you. Uh, for me, I was fortunate that I was in a great club and I had the opportunity to meet Glenn Crooks. Um, and, you know, through Glenn, it was just asking questions, you know, what, you know, just filling me in on what the next level was about and coaching and his experiences, um, you know, and putting yourself out there, you know, going to training sessions, watching uh, some really coaches that you respect, coaches that uh, are impressive to you, and going out watching those training sessions once you get an opportunity to, uh, to communicate with those coaches, ask them questions, um, and really pick their mind. And I think eventually, um, 
you know, that mentor is going to, you know, come forward. Uh, I was fortunate. I stumbled into PDA with Glenn Crooks, but I think if you're searching for someone, it's really about find the level, see, you know, what type of team, what type of uh, level do you want to be at, find that coach, watch them, and then really engross yourself into what they're doing and, um, you know, try to learn along the way. Well, we've talked about uh, fantastic mentors and, and people that have helped us along. Uh, John, you've had the opportunity to work with national champion Randy Waldrum for, for many years now. <laughs> How has his coaching and leadership style impacted you? And what can you tell others about that mentor in your life? Well, I was fortunate because uh, it started out with Randy and the fact that he coached me for a couple years. So I think I'm a little different than Kat and John in that way of I was able to play for somebody who um, really showed those values that I found important. Um, I think as someone that's extremely competitive myself, finding someone that was that passionate about the game and, and about competing and about really pushing yourself to make yourself better, um, he showed that when I was a player, you could see a coach who not only expected you to become better, but also made himself better by continuing to go to different coaching courses. You know, he was basically the instructor at every coaching course at the NSCAA and the Federation and, and took it upon himself to go over to overseas to do a UEFA course. Um, so watching someone else when you're, as a coach, expecting players to do that, you kind of watch your coach and say, okay, you, you gain that extra level of respect. But, but the other thing, especially with females, is uh, you know, as players, we want to make sure that the coaches actually care about you as people, just as much as you do, you know, about them as a as a player. And and being a player under under him, I found that that was obviously true. And so, knowing that he obviously had those same values, I found important, made it easy to know that he was somebody that I could look to uh, later on in my career. And then obviously, when I was fortunate enough to to step in on my role here. It was a great opportunity for me to see that on the other side, working alongside him and seeing how he did that. It's just not something that, that you have. Sometimes it's how you do it and how you present it so the players do do see that um, as well. And, and so he's taught me a lot during that. And I think that's that's the one thing when you're looking for a mentor. Like John said, you really have to go out there and see that. I was fortunate that it fell on my lap a little bit. But really knowing what you value, what, what you're, what's important for you and your philosophy, I think is, is first and foremost important. And then you'll kind of know when you do go out there um, what kind of person that you're looking for. And, and Kat, you know, we've talked about you've, you've played at a, a high level and you've, you've been at a, a number of universities. Um, you left an, an incredible program at UCLA. You were, you were a first assistant. The team had been to the Final Four. And you, you left that to kind of seek something on your own as a head coach. Um, what advice do you have for coaches who, who may have to leave something that's good for something that they hope could be better and, and maybe leave a, a comfortable position as a, as a top assistant for maybe an unknown position as a head coach? Um, yeah, you know, I think you, or, or for myself, I wanted to challenge myself. I want to keep pushing myself to become the best coach that I, that I can be. And in order for myself to do that, I know um, that I needed to be a head coach, and I wanted to give it a try. I worked with April Heinrichs at University of Virginia, and I worked with Jill Ellis at UCLA. And I really wanted to take what I learned from both of those coaches and apply it to my own university. Um, and so it was nerve-wracking, of course, uh, going out there by yourself. And uh, the best advice is, uh, you know, we've all touched upon it, is ask questions. You know, ask questions to your mentor. What would you do in this situation? What would you do in this situation? Um, you know, I relied heavily on, on those two coaches. Also, Paula Wilkins um, at the time was at Penn State. And, um, you know, just people that I, I could trust, uh, figuring out how to run a program. Um, because I don't think you realize... Uh, how different it is from when you become an assistant coach to becoming a head coach. Uh, a lot of different stresses come at you, um, but at the end of the day, it's completely rewarding knowing that you're there for the student athlete, knowing that you're there to make them better, not only on the soccer field, but in the classroom. Um, and it was just, a, it, it, I learned a lot um, at UNLV, and, um, and then from there, um, I left the head coaching position. I went to the University of Texas as an assistant coach. And a lot of people ask me, why did you leave a head coaching position for an assistant coach position? Um, and I wanted to continue to grow as a coach. Uh, Chris Petroselli, a uh, proven winner, um, you know, great coach at Notre Dame, great job at University of Texas, and I learned a lot from him. Um, so it was really important for me to have that in my coaching, uh, kind of my, my background, if you will, so I could uh, take that and apply it to my next program. Um, so all the spots that I have been in, um, and there have been a few, um, 
have really helped me uh, for this position here. Uh, you know, I'm really thankful for the opportunities that I've had. I'm very thankful to have worked at a small private school, St. Louis University. Um, those kids were awesome and they've taught me a lot. Um, but every spot I think that you go to, you have to learn something. You have to take away from something um, that can make you better. Um, so that, that's probably the advice. And I guess also get a good mover. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, Scott, you talked about your uh, your move from from teaching and, and going into the elementary school. We've got a question now from the internet. Philip Boyer asks, "What's the best way for a young coach who's 25 to transition from coaching at a high school level to to coaching at the collegiate level? What advice do you have for him?" Well, I don't think there's a uh, I don't think there's a a standard path. I think you hear all the different stories that, that, that everybody's sharing uh, today. There's not there's not one path, and it's not uh, a set of dominoes that you go from one to the next, and uh, you just climb that ladder. Um, it's really about just being open to every opportunity that that presents itself in whatever format that might be of our of our sport, and uh, you kind of navigate your way through. Uh, you know, whether it's club soccer, whether it's the uh, the Olympic Development Program. Um, whatever opportunity you get to work with, which you, whoever you get the opportunity to work with, I think it's just important to embrace it, to go after it, to do the very, very best professional job that you can, um, and for the right reasons. Do it for the, do it to be the best coach that you can be, um, rather than you know how much am I going to get paid for this for this week on the road doing doing this camp or this coaching job, um, and it's through that experience I think that you you will meet the right people. And those people will recognize that you, that you have the right work ethic and the right intention behind what you're doing. Um, and then those opportunities start to present themselves. And when they do, you just have to be ready to take those opportunities. Uh, you're never going to be ready for them. Um, I remember when I was offered uh, or when I was interviewing for the head coach job at UC Irvine, you know, uh, I think they were trying to figure out whether I was, whether I was ready for it. And you know, I, I was convincing them that I was ready for it. <laughs> Uh, and then you sit down, you're off this day one, you close the door and you're like, oh my goodness, what did I just take on? Um, and that's when, you, that's when you learn how to do it. So it's work hard, do it for the right reasons, um, and just be ready to embrace the opportunities when, when, when they come along. And then the subject of, of embracing opportunities, John, you were at Maryland for five years and then had the opportunity to become the head coach. Um, how was that transition from the, the assistant to the head and, and what were some of the challenges that you faced? Um, it, well, I, I think I'm fortunate because, you know, I had spent five years here and I wasn't walking into a new place. Um, you know, I have to be fair, I was pretty fortunate I had, uh, you know, we've talked about mentors, you know, and I think Brian Penske um, had prepared me for this job. Uh, within my five years as his assistant, he let me have the opportunity to be in every part of the program. So when it was my turn to take over, um, I felt like I was in a pretty good place to, uh, you know, handle the range here. Um, and also, I had great leadership within our senior class. I mean, um, those kids, you know, they'd been here for, for three years, going on their fourth year. They wanted to accomplish some really big things. Um, and so that group really grabbed our team. Um, and for my transition, it made it, uh, it made it pretty easy in a lot of ways. Um, they handled a lot of things that um, come with, with a new coach and come with uh, so many new players. Um, I think uh, the difficult part probably for my, my transition was um, being the one with the final say and having that final word. Um, yeah, it's easy sometimes as an assistant, and I don't mean to take anything away from assistants, but it's easy to come up with those ideas and suggestions uh, to really come with a final uh, decision is, you know, that's where it can be a little tricky and a little challenging sometimes. Um, and in addition, uh, we were also bringing in 12 freshmen into our team, and so uh, being able to mix those kids in with the current group uh, was a bit of a bit of a challenge, uh, but it was also a lot of fun as well. So um, the transition here probably a little bit easier than it was for most, but also certainly some some uh, some hurdles along the way. And when we talk about transition, all of you have really transitioned from from players to coaches. Uh, we'll start with Don, and then and then anybody else can really add in. But Don, um, you know, you went from playing with the Washington Freedom and the the San Jose Cyber Rays and being very focused on your your own career. And um, how was it transitioning to then being a coach and, and working with the team? Well, I always knew I wanted to be a coach. Um, like Scott was saying, it was just one of those things that you just kind of know and you feel that something you want to do is is teach. 
Um, so the transition, the hardest part about it, honestly, was is patience. Um, all of us have been players before you're a coach. You're used to being able to go out there, step on the field, and make the change, be able to kind of have that direct impact. And, and as a coach, you have to learn that patience of, I, I can't do that. <laughs> I have to be able to learn how to empower them to figure it out, empower them to be able to do that themselves. And, and I think that was probably my biggest challenge, honestly, um, moving into it, was being such a young coach. I think I was 24 when I took this job. I was only a couple of years older than the seniors on the team and, and being able to kind of step back every now and then and say, okay, they'll figure it out, they'll get it. As long as we teach them and give them the tools, um, they'll be okay. And and I think that the fortunate thing is I think I did have a little bit of respect coming in because of my playing background. And I think at that point you just have to back it up. Um, I think one thing to tell young coaches too is um, to show you have the confidence right away when you step in. Um, to do the job because I think when you're at a competitive level like all the coaches that are here today are, um, if, the co if the players see you hesitate or if they see you start to doubt, then that's when they start to kind of second guess you and I think once you step out there, you have to step out right away um, and let them know you know what you're talking about and that you have the confidence to do it and that gives them the confidence to succeed as well. Okay. Um... John, I know you've coached a number of, of club teams and your, your current uh, kids are actually freshmen and, and sophomores in college now. Um, we've got a question from Norm Heffer who's at Apache Junction High School. He coaches a U10 girls team and he's having the hardest time getting them to check to the ball. Um, and when they do, they're constantly turning and running instead of playing the way that they face. Do you have any games or activities that you could talk to him about that might be able to correct them? He also has a high school team that struggles with, with checking to the ball, too. <laughs> Ten-year-olds. Um, well, geez, I'm trying to get 18 to 22-year-olds to do that <laughs> properly, so let's see if I can, if I can help here. Um, you know, I think each age, obviously, you have to have an understanding of what they cognitively can understand be able to execute. Uh, with 10 year olds, they're just beginning to get to the point where they can see more than just themselves in the ball. Um, and so trying to connect them with another player or two players, um, it takes time and it's a bit of a process. Um, one of the things that we, we do here and something that I've done when I was working with younger players, club kids, is just put them simply in groups of three where you have two kids that are passing back and forth. Um, you have a third player, which is going to be your checking player. Um, they're going to be about 15, 10, 15 yards away. Um, and you just want to get that rhythm between the three players. And um, one, you have to teach the player that's uh, checking the cues, okay, the timing of the check. When do you go? Is it when the player opens up, the eye contact? Uh, what do they do when they're approaching to go find the ball? Um, checking their shoulder. Those are some simple things that you can talk about. But, you know, going back to how you would do the game is just in threes, Two players passing the ball side to side, uh, another player that's up high kind of floating with their passes. Uh, when one player opens up, you're going to have that target check back to the ball because now that's the cue for the check. Um, you can have that player play into the checking player, and then you can make some combinations off of it. That player that's checking, she can lay it down to the player that delivered the first ball um, and then curl out, or you can have her deliver a um, play pass to the player that's off of the ball. So now you're working on the timing of that check. Um, you're working on laying the ball down and playing the way that you face. And then there's also a little combination after it where the player might curl out and then there's a second pass delivered. Okay. I hope Fantastic. that makes sense <laughs> without a diagram. I was picturing it in my mind's eye as you were talking. Okay. Um, you know, we talk about competition and, and we talk about the expectations that we have for our players. We've got Greg Soma, who's a uh, boys and girls coach at Westlake Middle School, and, and he said he once heard a coach state that it was not possible to compete at a high level while having fun. Um, as a middle school coach, I strongly agree with this statement. I wanted to know your thoughts on this. And, and Don, in the background, we've got your two national championship trophies. Um, do the kids at Notre Dame have fun? I would hope so. <laughs> uh, I definitely think so. I, I definitely disagree that you, you can't have fun to, to compete at a high level. I think if it weren't fun, why would anybody do it? Um, as an extremely competitive person, like I said before, I think um, when you're able to compete at a high level like that, and really the, the challenges are what makes it fun. Um, I think that's part of the 
one of the big things for female athletes, I think, sometimes is they're trying to engage as, as girls that you can't compete and, and be nice and do that kind of stuff. And I think that's something that you learn is it's okay, <laughs> to, especially with girls, to let them know it's okay to compete and uh, really challenge each other. And you still can be great friends off the field and still have those relationships. And, and playing at the professional level, I, I can tell you right now, we had a great time <laughs> when we were at practice. And I think sometimes just not taking yourself too seriously of what you're doing, I mean, then it's still a game. Um, we all want to succeed and we all want to do well and, and challenge and push, our, push ourselves to be the best. But, but if it's not fun, I don't think any of those girls would do it. I don't think you can probably ask Abby Wambach and those guys all the hours of the day they put in to being as good as they are. Um, they do it because it's fun. They do it because they can compete at that level. And, and, they, and they, fight, they fight hard and they do a lot of work to do it. But, but to them, it's still fun. So I, I would definitely say it's absolutely possible. And you can watch any player out there. You can watch Champions League and see how much fun they have playing against each other, and and that's why they do it. It's it's not just for a paycheck at the professional level either. It, it's it's the the fact that they've enjoyed it all through growing up, and and they've made it to that point. So yeah. Okay. And I'd I'd like to pose this to John and and Kat and Scott. Um, what are some things that you do with your college players to to build? A sense of teamwork and, and keep the game fun because you are training a lot of hours and um, it does consume a lot of a, a college player's life. What are what are some things that you look to to do with your team? Um, well, I guess I can take that one first. Um, you know, it this the college soccer. It, yeah, sometimes it can come across as a job because these kids are out there four, five, six days a week and it's a lot and it's challenging and it's demanding to be competing against players and competing for a position every single day. Uh, we, we try to make training light at times and we try to make sure that the activities that we're doing are stimulating and challenging for the kids. I think um, you know just competitive players they always want to be challenged with something um, new and something that's difficult. Uh, but then there's another side of things too where we've, we've split our team into uh, just random teams. We've called it a Terp Cup where we've split them into random teams um, and had them do just silly, completely, totally different um, activities outside of soccer um, for points. And um, if you really want to see the competitiveness come out, you can see it in this Terp Cup because um, you put uh, you split up the girls into two teams for bowling, and you can see how uh, <laughs> how rough they can get, you know. But that, those are some things that you have to do, particularly in a long season when you're just trying to break up the monotony. You just got to come up with some pretty uh, different ideas and things that take you away from the game, and that helps keep the players fresh and it helps keep them um, enjoying the atmosphere that they're in. So, um, a variety of ways that you can go about it. Yeah, I would agree. Um, you know, the, the college season's fun. Um, you know, and unfortunately, the season's really, truly only in the fall. So the spring is a lot of time to work on, um, you know, individual needs, technical needs, but it's also a good time to work on our team and coming together as a team. Um, and I've been here about five months now, and uh, a lot of what we've been doing here is trying to come together as a team. Um, a little bit different than like a Don um, or all the coaches, they're, they've had their teams a little bit more established. Um, they've been successful winning ACC, uh, you know, winning the national championship. We're, I'm a new staff, and so we have to find a way to come together because um, I think we put a lot of time and effort into performing on the field, and we also have to put a lot of time and effort into coming together as a team. So we'll break it up and do different competitive things, do different things. Um, we did team handball just recently. Um, you know, I mean, uh, like a uh, duck cup, if you will, uh, similar to the ter Terrapin Cup. Um, so I think we all have our different ways uh, to find it, but, you know, really reminding the girls to play with passion uh, because that's uh, – it's a long season, and, and we want to be playing into December, you know, and in order to be playing into December, we have to find a way to keep them engaged, keep them fresh, keep them playing together, um, and keep them having some fun, uh, because ultimately we do have fun when we play this game and coach this game. Scott, do you have anything to add with that? Gosh, I'm not sure I can uh, add too much to that. that was, uh, but I agree with all those things. I think variety is a huge part of it. I think you've got to challenge yourself, you know, to find that balance between uh, doing things at practice that the players understand. So you don't spend uh, the majority of your practices teaching a new activity or a new uh, a new game because you want to get the get the best value out of your time. But at the same time, you know, work hard to to provide that variety. 
Um, I think it comes in lots and lots of different shapes and sizes. It's, uh, it's stuff with the team on and off the field. Uh, it's when you're on the road. Uh, there's certain, whether it's team meals or team activities that you can do, you know, you can sit in a hotel all day or you can go and ride a roller coaster, you know, uh, which is, you know, some of the things that we've done. Um, but uh, on the, you know, the expectation for us is that it's not going to be the kind of uh, uh, skipping through the meadow type fun every single day of practice. That's a, that's a teaching piece as well. You know, sometimes we can have that kind of fun. It might be in just one one piece of practice, uh, but the reality is to compete at the highest level, you've, you've got to grind it out sometimes, and it's uh, and it doesn't feel good uh, when you're pushing yourself at, at the really highest level. So it's an educational piece as well as all the uh, the fun fun uh, uh, elements. Um, it's really starting to understand that it's about delayed gratification, and you might not get the reward that you're looking for right now today. But the hard, tough work that we put in uh, is going to pay off some sometime down the line, hopefully. Okay. And now we've got a, a question from Manu Ariaza, and it's for Cat. And he says, "Dear Cat, have you already chosen a tactical formation for Oregon <laughs> soccer?" Um. Funny you ask. Uh, we had a formation that we were working on all fall. I mean, all spring. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we took a, an injury um, that has made us uh, kind of adjust our formation. So we were flo floating back and forth between a 4-4-2 with a diamond in the midfield. Um, and uh, we, we lost our holding midfielder about two and a half weeks ago. So um, not very fun uh, moving forward for the fall. But I think we're going to try out a variety of different formations, either a 4-2-3-1 or 4-3-3 or some formation of that so we can have some numbers around the midfield. Um, you know, we played uh, Washington and Oregon State um, and a couple of other uh, schools this spring, um, and it really gave me a, a, a good sense of what the Pac-12 uh, is like, and we need to strengthen up our midfield. So we need to have some numbers around that midfield. So unfortunately, um, I don't know if the 4-4-2 is going to work out this uh, fall, um, but we'll definitely uh, uh, work on it and see if our midfielders coming in for the fall will be able to handle it. Okay. And, John, we've got another question from the Internet. Stuart Givens asks, what's the most important or best advice you ever received from a mentor? Um, that's a pretty easy one because I've gotten it from a couple of coaches. Um, <laughs> from Brian uh, Penske and then also another person that I consider a mentor uh, and Mark Akorian and it's just um, whatever you believe in go with it um, you know there's always going to be some doubters and there's always going to be some question marks and even yourself you're going to have moments where you where you doubt uh, but ultimately you have to believe in whatever your philosophy is um, don't compromise your thoughts um, and, and you have to just go for it um, you know, obviously along the way you're, you're talking to people and you're learning and you're trying to evolve your own thoughts or your own philosophy, but whatever it is, just be strong in your convictions and, and believe in it. Terrific. Uh, we've got another question here. This one is from Jose Mota. Um, and he said he's having trouble keeping players in his club. He's losing them to other sports. And he was wondering if you had any ideas or suggestions on how to recruit and retain more young female players. And this can go to Dawn or any of the coaches, but we'll, we'll start with Dawn. And <laughs> yeah, I actually was just reading an article in the Soccer Journal um, about this on our trip out to PDA this weekend about they talk about percentages of players in, that are leaving the sport and just deciding not to play soccer when in reality if you think about the youth or youth sports in general that soccer is the most popular at a youth age uh, but for some reason it becomes less and less popular as you get up. Um, I think it's um, I think a lot of it's about keeping it fun and creative but I think even as um, Scott had mentioned was teaching them something new. I think uh, even though we talk about being competitive and having fun, I think you can still have fun by learning uh, about the game and challenging them in different ways so they feel like they're actually getting better and they can see that progression. I think sometimes it's either ext extremely competitive and we feel like everything's about wins and losses or it's all about <laughs> running through the meadows and having a good time. Um, but I think that there's that great balance and I think if you challenge um, people, I think people are more engaged and I think that they will continue to come back and do that. But obviously like they, um, they've been talking about before, so the variety 
of activities and different things you can do. But um, also keeping, I would say, the clubs now, kids are changing from one club to another. I think if, if we can get where people consistently stay with one club, it becomes more of a family. Uh, I think that's how it was when I was in club um, with youth soccer is you didn't want to leave the, the soccer team because you didn't want to leave that family because you were so tightly connected, not just with each other, but with the coach as well. And I think coaches having consistency of staying with the club and doing that, I think they'll find that less and less as well. Okay. Uh, Scott, we've got a question here from Lloyd Owers, and he said, how hard is it for a UK coach to get a college university coaching position, and would you have any tips for him? Gosh, I, I actually get a lot of, a lot of emails from, uh, from folks from the UK asking me those kind of questions, and it's, uh, um, you know, it's similar to how I answered the, the, the question before. Um, there aren't there isn't a book that you, that you can read and go one chapter at a time. Um, you've got to uh, got to leave the ego at the door. That's 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 a key one, I think. You know, a lot of British guys uh, and girls come over here and and, and coach. And uh, you know, I was probably guilty of this when I first moved over. That I was coming from a very uh, very rich tradition of uh, of British soccer and European soccer. Um, and uh, you kind of you kind of look around the, the United States and you think if I if I can only bring that kind of culture over here, uh, this could this could really develop into something. Um, but uh, what I learned was you're dealing with a different culture. The, the, the United States soccer culture it's it's uh, it has its own culture and, it's de and has defined itself. Uh, so if you try and come and uh, and, and just coach from your uh, um, British background, uh, it's really not going to work very well. Uh, because there's already a rich tradition here, and you have to find a way to uh, to blend what you know uh, with the culture that you're coming into. Um, and I think uh, you know, I, you know, you, you run into a lot of British egos, uh, unfortunately. Um, and I think if, uh, if if a lot of British and British coaches would just just soften their approach a little bit and uh, uh, be open to learning new things, because uh, you know there's so many different approaches to this to this sport, and that's one of the fun things about it. Um, so check the ego at the door, embrace the opportunities, uh, really look to blend with the culture that, you, that you're moving into, approach things with a, uh, with a humility, um, and, uh, and just go out and work hard every, every opportunity you get. And here's another question that we have for you guys. You know, we talk about the importance of networking for young coaches and making those connections, and you, you've all had the opportunity to work with uh, terrific coaches. How important is it? Is it getting out and getting to the NSC convention and, and, and mingling and, and meeting people, and, and how has that impacted um, your careers? If anyone wants to hop in on this. I, I guess I would say that I um, I started a lot with uh, the coaching courses. Um, you know, I have a lot of network uh, people that I've met um, through the coaching courses that I've done. Um, you know, my first assistant at UNLV, um, I met him through a coaching course, and I think it's really important to go in environments, meet people, um, stay connected with these people, um, go into the coaching conventions, uh, and the conventions are great. Uh, it's a great tool and a great resource to get new um, information. I think we're always trying to learn and, and grow as a coach, and, and you can put yourself out there and say, oh, that's a different way to, to teach that, or oh, that's pretty cool, that's interesting. Um, you know, I, I've worked, watched a couple of great sessions, and I've taken them back. Um, I was fortunate just to, Don, you're lucky, I, I was fortunate to work with uh, Randy with the 23s uh, like two weeks ago. Um, I took back one of his sessions, you know, so I think anytime you can meet those people and keep them in your networking, um, you know, list of people that you can continue to grow and talk to um, and get information from, it's definitely a key factor. Yeah, I would say that the coaching courses and uh, the NCAA convention have, have been some of the best um, ways for me to network with individuals and just meet new people. And like Kat says, you just you're just gaining ideas, and you're you know all of us are probably on some level soccer geeks, and so that thirst for for more knowledge and different ways of doing things is um, you know it's, it has been top priority for us. And I don't think without the convention or the coaching courses. You have the opportunity and access to meet as many people um, that have the same desire and wants that you have. Um, you know, I, I'm pretty fortunate in just some of the coaching courses that I've had um, that those people that I've met in there have, 
helped me get into the college game. They've helped me, um, you know, meet other coaches to get to Ohio State. Helped me meet Brian Penske to get here to Maryland, and so um, pretty fortunate, you know. So you really have to put yourself out there, um, ask questions again, like we said earlier, and uh, um, you know, utilize the people that you meet. And I think he, I'm sorry, Don. Sorry. Yeah. No, I just wanted to chime in just a little because I think obviously the coaching courses in the convention are huge, but I think too, putting yourself out there and just watching other teams. I think um, Kat and I, you know, we've known each other through passing a little bit, but um, being able to go out and, and observe her working at the U23 national team in Phil Wedden and, and being able to put yourself out there going watching professional teams and, and sitting down and meeting and talking with those coaches, it, it's a different environment when you actually can see them in a, in a real environment, really, that we don't really get to see each other work in very often uh, and I think th that's another great way that I think some people don't do. I don't know how many times we talk about it in our office of um, you know local club coaches or local high school coaches they might come and ask us questions at our, at our um, coaching clinic that we run here but they don't ever come out and watch our, us work with our teams on a regular basis when we're in their backyard and I'm sure the rest of the coaches here on this panel would probably agree that people don't take advantage of really going and, and speaking with each other on a day-to-day -day basis not just at conventions or coaching courses that's free you can just walk into somebody's <laughs> office and ask those questions or you know can I go watch a session or two and, and I think uh, taking advantage of that is huge and I think, um, you know, to wrap up, we've, we've gone a little bit over, but you, you've all made some great points. And, and just to summarize, you, you've talked about the importance of getting out there. Scott, you mentioned just volunteer. You might not get paid, but, but get involved with ODP and, and get involved and, and, and be a part of different programs and seeing different things. And, John, you, you've mentioned that networking and the, the coaches that you've made. And, Kat, you've said that the coaches that you've met at the courses have been so important and I think one of the big things is is you know today we're launching the NSCA's 30 under 30 program um, and this is a just an unbelievable opportunity that the NSCA is offering to to go out and find the top 30 coaches um, and help them extend their career and, and improve their career so I want to thank the panel today you have been terrific and I'm sure we're gonna have even more questions uh, and I also want to talk about the fact that the NSCA is seeking to identify the next 30 under 30 coaches who are serious about taking their careers to the next level. Um, all four of you have done an unbelievable job of, of starting out and, and putting in the time and doing the work to get to the positions where you are and hopefully this 30 under 30 program will help 30 new coaches do that. Um, the 30 under 30 program will provide a mentorship opportunity. We've talked about the importance of, of talking to coaches. So you'll have the opportunity to be partnered with a mentor. You'll also get an all expense paid convention or summer symposium trip. And you also get a free uh, advanced level course. And the biggest thing is you're going to get access to all of the things that these four coaches talked about. So please go out and visit nsca.com backslash 30 under 30 for details and apply today and Kat, Dawn, John and Scott I appreciate your time here I know it's been helpful I know I've enjoyed talking to you guys and I'm sure everybody else has good luck with uh, your summer recruiting and next fall with your seasons thank thanks you. Harry thank you